just put up your slides or do you want me to introduce you first or? I can put up a, a title slide here. Okay, while well, Nate's getting that up, um, I just want to introduce him. So it's really um, our great pleasure to introduce a longtime friend and colleague of Gabe and mine, Nate Mara. Um, Nate hails now from the Department of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science um, at University of Minnesota. Um, I had the great pleasure of working very closely with Nate and Sasha Belotsky when we started the Institute for Material Science at Los Alamos. And, and I can tell you that those weekly meetings that involved Nate and Sasha uh, were some of the most creative meetings filled with awesome science, but also some of the most hilarious uh, and uh, laugh prov provoking meetings that, we, that I was part of each week. And that's largely not only because Nate is one of the most hilarious humans I know, but uh, one of the greatest scientists I know as well. And so Nate is a highly published and cited author. He's a past director's fellow of Los Alamos, TMS Young Leader Awardee, Distinguished Mentor Awardee, and International Journal of Plasticity Investigator Awardee, and many others. And because Nate lived in New Mexico for so very long, of course, his title involves something to do with Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So I'll, uh, I'll let Nate uh, take it away and tell you about nanoscale deformities. Uh, and then he will take questions whenever you're ready, but uh, he has themes is what he says. Yeah, we can, um, we can certainly uh, uh, go into questions. There's about two or three different uh, breaks that we can pick out as we go along. Uh, but thank you for the, uh, for the kind introduction, uh, Professor Martinez. And I'd like to thank uh, you and uh, the professors Montano for, uh, for inviting me to this, this colloquium. It's an honor to be here and to share some of, uh, of our team's work on this interface, interface driven deformation and fracture at the nanoscale. So of course, after spending 12 years in uh, Los Alamos, fantastic years working with, uh, with Jen and others. Um, yes, I had to, had to uh, refer to some of my New Mexico background. And when we think about Breaking Bad, we're not going to go quite so illegal in this case, although fracture can be tragic and quite violent. So there's certainly a theme there. Um, I'd like to go ahead and thank um, my, my current collaborators, Yuxing Chen, who's actually a, a past postdoc who's now at uh, University of North Carolina, Charlotte as a, as a research prof. Justin Cheng and Kevin Schmalbach, both PhD students working with me. Uh, Bill Gerberich, who's a uh, professor emeritus, has been at the University of Minnesota for over 40 years, still very active, worked with him a, a lot. And then there's a whole crew of people who uh, had some, some uh, affiliation with Los Alamos in, in some way, shape, or form down here at the bottom. I won't go through them all, but you'll be seeing uh, snippets of their work as well. And so also, can't go anywhere without thanking the, uh, the sponsors, so DOE Office of Science, uh, Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies at uh, Sandia and Los Alamos, and of course, Los Alamos National Lab, where I was uh, up until about three years ago. So, start off my talk, uh, talk a little bit about this presentation by Richard Feynman, 1959 at Caltech. Um, very colorful character, Richard Feynman. I'm sure many of you know him. But this talk was really reg regarded as the basis of nanotechnology, where he was really talking about manipulating and controlling things on a small scale. Richard Feynman is famous for lots of different quotes, some of which are, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. Very true. One of my other favorites, Europeans are much more serious than we are in America because they think that a good place to discuss intellectual matters is a beer party. Interesting. And uh, Feynman also had a background at, uh, at Los Alamos. He was a student there actually working on the Manhattan Project. And there at Los Alamos, we all had to wear badges showing who we were and we swiped them to get into different labs and places around the campus. And this is what Feynman looked like back in 1943. Looked like a bit of a troublemaker. And his next quote here, what do you care what other people think is my personal top favorite uh, that he's got. And it's consistent with his personality. But beyond these, these quotes, he also has more technical things. So for instance, better electron microscopes. Put this out as a challenge. Can you make the electron microscope more powerful? Can you miniaturize by evaporation? Can you put atoms down in a certain arrangement, evaporate one, then evaporate the next, then another? 
Can you rearrange atoms? Can you put them one by one the way that we want them? What could we do with layered structures with just the right layers? These are fantastic questions and we can actually realize these things now, decades later. So here's uh, an image of uh, aberration corrected TEM. This one actually sits at Los Alamos. Uh, we have similar types of microscopes at uh, the University of Minnesota as well. But nowadays we can image individual columns of atoms and figure out what the defect uh, distribution is in these materials. We can look at interfaces between two metals. So here's copper, here's niobium. And we can look at exactly what this morphology of this interface is. We know the crystallography, we know the chemistry, all the way down to the atomic scale. We can make these materials. We can layer one material after the other using things like magnetron sputtering. We'll talk about this. Again, this is another one from Los Alamos. And so Kevin Baldwin produces still today a lot of the materials that you're going to see uh, in this presentation. So this has all been incredibly uh, 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 fortuitous that, and also there's a lot of foresight involved from Feynman, but this all, all has started to come together now in the present where we live. <clears throat> so today, what we're going to cover is basically four different, uh, different topics. So first we'll talk about damage resistant bulk nanocomposites, talk about interface dominance and what that means, talk about uh, mechanically induced defects in materials, what those are, uh, we'll talk about uh, controllable interfacial atomic structures that dictate mechanical behaviors. We'll talk about a couple of different ways to, to make these kind of layered structures that we'll be talking about today, these nanocomposites. And then we'll talk about their mechanical behaviors and how the structure of these materials relates to their mechanical uh, response. Compare about three different uh, types of interfaces here, especially some particularly interesting new results over the last year or so of these three-dimensional, chemically diffuse, physical vapor deposited interfaces. Really, really interesting uh, results there. And then we'll talk also about uh, plasticity effects on small scale fracture. <clears throat> so interface material behavior, what is it? Well, there's a couple of different uh, regimes of behavior, one of which we can think of as constituent dominated behavior. This is what happens with things like your, your um, uh, metals that you'd buy from the hardware store, where the individual uh, phases within the material, say metal A or metal B, could be a metal and a polymer, could be a metal and a ceramic, doesn't matter. But usually the phases are what control the defects. And when we talk about defects, we're talking about dislocations in this case, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. Defects of, such as dislocations are the carriers of plasticity or permanent deformation in the material. So in normal situations, the phases are what control those defects, their nucleation, their storage, their recovery, and their blocking. But as you shrink layer thicknesses down to just a few nanometers, you start getting into interface dominated behavior, where it doesn't matter what you make the material out of. It could be copper and niobium, it could be silver and copper, it could be silver and vanadium, it could be all kinds of different things, titanium nitride and, uh, and aluminum. What matters is the structure of the interface because you start getting so much interface content that the interfaces start to control these defect processes. And so what do these defects look like? So this is an, not actually a set of atoms, but it's a model. And so the way that this works is you take a, uh, it's called a bubble raft. You take uh, a bunch of very uh, evenly spaced or evenly uh, distributed bubbles, uh, soap bubbles, sitting on top of a um, uh, uh, container of water. And you can actually see a dislocation here. And I'll go ahead and draw it because it's a little bit easier to see. This extra half plane is the defect in the otherwise perfect crystalline lattice. And so this region right here is known as the dislocation core. And you can actually see the distortions associated with this core. And it's these, the motion of these dislocations that control the deformation of all kinds of uh, different crystalline materials, from bending a paper clip to what happens when you stamp out a door panel of a car to what happens when you crash that car. Everything that happens in that material is controlled by these defects. And so why are they so interesting? Well, one of the founders of modern material science, Sir Charles Frank said, 
people or materials are like people, it's the defects that are really make them interesting. <clears throat> so here's a little bit more about those dislocations, right? So if we have an extra half plane, which looks like this, we've got our crystalline lattice, we've got a bunch of bonds, we can number the atoms, two, three, one here, and we can apply a shear stress in the horizontal direction. When we do that, we can label our dislocation. We label them with little T's um, to denote the half plane that's sitting there. <clears throat> and then what happens is as you apply the shear stress, you'll start to break these bonds, say between one and three, and then you'll form a bond between one and two. And the dislocation moves over. You repeat this process over and over again until you get a step at the surface. And so you end up having mass transport, a net movement of material from one part of the material to another. And if you have billions and billions of these things going through the material all at the same time, you collectively can permanently deform a material. You can put a radius onto something. You can stamp a part out. This is what enables this. So how dislocations interact with each other and how they, um, how they interact with interfaces is key to how the mechanical response of the material ensues. And so we actually, we actually denote this with this Berger's vector, B, which has both a direction and a magnitude. And in this case, it's, uh, it's this, this magnitude between atomic planes here. And so what we're gonna talk about today is making the life of these little dislocations really terrible. We're gonna put in a bunch of obstacles. So these are almost like speed bumps to these kinds of, uh, of defects. So we're gonna think about putting things like uh, a phase B and a phase A, multi-layering multi -layering these, and, uh, and essentially making their, their existence more and more difficult. So you don't have to take my word for this. They actually do exist. People have seen them in the electron microscope for about the last 60, 60 or actually 70 years now. <clears throat> and so what we have here is an electron um, micrograph. It's high resolution, so you can see individual lattice planes. Hopefully you can see those there as well. And in this case, we've got alternating layers of niobium, copper, and niobium. And what we're going to do is compress this material in the transmission electron microscope from the lower right-hand corner. And what you're going to see are dislocations that nucleate at one interface, travel across the layer, disappear in the op opposing interface. And so this is what I'm talking about when we talk about interface dominance is that these dislocations are born and they die in the interface. So that structure of that interface is what dictates exactly how this material deforms. So why do we care? <clears throat> well, these interface driven properties that arise from these, um, these uh, interface structures are outstanding. So we can take two soft, nominally soft metals like copper, no different than what you would get at the hardware store. Niobium, another very, very soft metal. You start layering them up with just uh, nanometers in their layer thickness, and you can increase things like penetration resistance for armor materials. They resist shock and, and uh, shock-induced damage. They can have outstanding thermal stability. Here's one that's made out of copper and niobium. You can anneal this for 500 degrees C for an hour, and nothing happens to the structure. That's half the melting point of copper, which is one of your constituents. You can deform these. We'll talk about this in, at length here. In this case, 58 nanometer layer thickness, and you can load these materials up, and they have a flow stress of about a gigapascal. That's similar to what you'd see in a lot of steels. Um, although, in this case, we're not alloying anything. We're not playing any tricks with chemistry. We're just playing tricks with interfaces. Same thing goes for outstanding radiation damage resistance. You layer this material up and you'll have regions close to the interface that absorb the radiation induced defects. And so you can essentially make a material that heals itself as it is uh, either pulled or pushed in different ways or irradiated, this, uh, this material ends up being very, very robust. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about two different ways that we make these. So physical vapor deposition, which is PVD, that's what we do in a uh, deposition chamber. So you make a thin film, can be removed from a substrate, could be sitting on silicon, you can do uh, a variety of things with it. The other one is kind of heat it and beat it metallurgy. This is called accumulative roll bonding or ARB. And in this case, 
<clears throat> what you've got is a big rolling mill. This one sits at Los Alamos National Lab in their Sigma facility. You'll have two big rollers. You can see the edge of one right here. There's one down below this table. You look at it on end and you've got this big roller and you can actually take two or multiple sheets of material, stack them up and push them through this slot and they will bond upon being rolled and pressed in between the rolls. So in the end, what we're gonna do here is really try to work on this hypothesis. That's that the atomic structure of an interface dictates its mechanical response. You make different atomic structures, you'll get different mechanical behaviors. You can control that synthesis. You can make materials that can do things that others really, really can't. So we're gonna talk about interfaces. So what do I mean by an interface? So there are five parameters that define a specific type of interface when you're talking about crystalline materials. You got crystal A, you got crystal B. Three parameters define these axes and their relative orientation to one another. That's called your orientation relationship. But then you've got to figure out how to cut these things and put them together. And so what you do then is you have two more parameters that define the interface plane between them. And so that defines the entire geometry of that interface. So let's talk about some of these interfaces. <clears throat> so if you're going to take two uh, dissimilar materials, so we'll talk about copper and niobium first, we'll get into some other material systems as well. Um, if you take two of these, or a, a layer of copper and a layer of niobium, and you put them together, niobium is body-centered cubic, copper is face-centered cubic. So if we join them, as you see here on the right, along their mutual compact planes and directions, <clears throat> what we start to see is that you can't just put them together and have them stick uh, very easily. And the reason is, is that they have these different crystal structures. So just putting them together would require huge elastic distortions at the interface to accommodate that mismatch between the two phases. So the material does what's easiest. It puts in defects. So those extra half planes that I showed that are responsible for plastic deformation, you can also put them in to just relieve the geometric mismatch between two different materials. So you can place them periodically at the interface and that relieves that misfit strain. Now, different interfaces have different distributions of these kinds of defects. So if we think about copper and niobium, again, and instead of joining them, along their mutual uh, compact planes and directions, we can join them along their 112. And that's what we see in the ARB interface. And this, this interface is completely different than what we see from the PVD or physical deposited, uh, physical vapor deposited interface. In the case of ARB, you have this kind of serration between copper and niobium, noted by this dotted line. Here's our 112 planes in both copper and niobium. And when we now look at our distribution of uh, dislocation, misfit dislocation content at the interface, we've got ones that reside in plane like this, very similar to PVD. And then we have ones that are, have an out of plane Berger's vector. This completely changes the way that this material performs. And we'll see that in a moment. So, <clears throat> This is what we're going to see here today. So we've talked here a little bit about the PVD interface, copper and niobium here. <clears throat> we have the planes, the 111 planes in copper and the 110 directions in copper are parallel to the 110 planes in niobium and the 111 directions in niobium. All the Berger's vectors required of the dislocations required to relieve the strain mismatch are in plane. So that's one important feature of this. And we have this, this quantity here, ISS. That's the interfacial shear strength, or how difficult it is to shear one phase relative to the other. You'll see that being an important quantity as well. We compare that to the ARB interface that we just talked about, much higher interfacial shear strength, but also has out of plane Berger's vectors. And then we're gonna compare those two to this 3D gradient interface, which has the same orientation relationship and interface plane as the two-dimensional PVD interface up at the top, but now we're going to put in a chemical gradient, which also turns out to be a structural gradient between the two phases. 
And this is actually a, a paper that's now, uh, now been published in Acumet. Um, but you start seeing, again, very, very different mechanical behavior in this case. <clears throat> so a little bit about how we make these. Uh, let's talk about physical vapor deposited uh, material first. <clears throat> these are made in a, in a sputter chamber, so magnetron sputtering. You take a substrate, rotating substrate, you can deposit either copper or niobium, and you build up your structure one layer at a time. So you grow niobium, you grow copper, then you grow niobium, then you grow copper. These are polycrystalline foils. So you do have grain boundaries that you can see within the structure. We have this kind of columnar known as a bamboo uh, morphology where the out of plane direction is similar between all of these different uh, columns, uh, but the, there is an in plane rotation between them. So that's what gives you your polycrystalline feature. Um, we can control layer thickness. We can make these fairly thick for mechanical testing. And the copper niobium system, limited solu solid solubility, high positive heat of mixing, and you've got these semi-coherent interfaces, which means they contain uh, misfit dislocations accommodating the mismatch between copper and niobium. And of course, this is our orientation relationship, which we already talked about. It's known as the kurjamov sachs orientation relationship. Why is that important? Because this is also one that is uh, very commonly seen in steels. And so what we see here and the physics that we understand from this interface transfers directly over to other very industrially relevant uh, material systems. <clears throat> so what happens when we squish these? That's the big question. <clears throat> so what we did is we, uh, so some time ago back, oh wow, 10 years ago now. So we fashioned some micro pillars. These are made in the focused iron beam mill. So this is basically a machining tool that can machine things down to Oh, you know, only 100 nanometers in diameter or something like that. Um, to tell you how small this is, right, 100 microns is a human hair diameter, depends on the individual. These pillars we're squashing are only four microns wide. So these are tiny, tiny um, uh, samples. And so if we have a layer direction that initially starts out here um, in the horizontal direction and we compress it vertically, we get these stress strain curves. So you can see we have an elastic region. And then we start getting permanent deformation. The curve starts to bend over. And then we reach a peak. And then we start seeing this softening that occurs. These stresses at which this occur are extremely high. This is 1.7 GPA. This is going to be as strong as, uh, especially at the five nanometer layer thickness level, approaching that of tool steel. Again, all that's in this is copper and niobium. We're not playing any tricks with, uh, with alloying case. So this is just the power of those interfaces themselves. And what you see when you compress these afterwards is something that looks like this. So yep, the pillar got shorter, it got fatter, um, but we have this shear band that has formed through the material. What we can do is we can take this back to the fib, section it, and stick that in the TEM. And this gives us some detail of what it is that happened within this shear band. But what we found was that you have your layers, which you can see right here. And if you follow a given layer from left to right across the shear band, you see that those layers have rotated, but they remain continuous across that shear band until you head over to the right. And so we thought, this is kind of strange. What is it that's giving rise to this? You can zoom in on a region like this, right on the edge of the shear band, and you'll see these types of micrographs. So here's our region within the shear band where we have extremely high strains. The layers have th thinned about uh, three quarters of their original thickness. And outside of the shear band, they haven't uh, deformed much at all, only 10 or 15%. So it makes you wonder what is happening inside this shear band? Well, what we found <coughs> in, in this work was that once these layers have rotated now into an orientation where there is a resolved shear stress on that interface, they start to slide and they slide really, really easily. How did we find this out? Well, we stuck it into the TEM again. We made a little pillar and then we put this at a certain orientation where now we will apply a shear stress on this pillar. And so you can see our individual layers here. When we do that, what happens is you can see it slide like a deck of cards, just right at that interface. And so we found that the interfacial shear strength of this material is extremely low. 
It's about 300 to 500 MPa. When we're thinking about the overall strength of that material, when we were compressing uh, perpendicular to those layers before those interfaces rotate, you're talking about stresses that are many times that, you know, about three to four times that. And so um, the question is, is now, well, how does this actually compare to some of these other materials that we've done? So if we move to just wrap up what we found here, what we found is that the atomic structure of this particular type of interface dictates its mechanical behavior. The interface is weak in shear, as I mentioned. We form this single shear band, which coincides with strain softening. So you can imagine we rotate the layers, they start to shear, materials weak in shear, so you see the soft effect. But it brings up other questions. What happens if we start messing with this atomic structure? What happens under mechanical loading? So before I move on to the next, uh, the next uh, uh, set of interfaces that we're gonna talk about, any questions on what I've brought up so far? Yeah, yeah Nate, um, I got a question on this. Uh, is there a, a modulus limit in terms of the metals to absorbing these defects at the interface or is it, is it just the crystalline packing? Oh, good, good question. So, so yeah, so the, the modulus of the material, the local modulus and, and elastic properties of the, uh, the material is what dictates um, to a large extent the motion of these dislocations because you're making and breaking bonds locally. And so the local strain field around that dislocation is key to what that dislocation sees around it. So when it sees an elastic modulus mismatch, so say you're coming from copper going into niobium, um, that uh, change in elastic modulus uh, will uh, give rise to what's called an image force. And so that image force is something that can either aid in bringing the dislocation towards the interface or it can repel it depending on what the relative moduli are. This becomes extremely important when we move on to the 3D interface, because now what we've done is not only do you have a discrete difference in the moduli between the two pure phases, now you have a mixed region that could have all kinds of variation in modulus uh, across that, that 3D interface. Yeah, and do they, I guess that makes sense. And, and is there a certain matching that has to occur between them or, or again, like an upper limit in terms of, of, of one, one metal interfacing with the next? Yeah, so the modulus, the local modulus would be bounded by whatever your stiffer of the two phases would be. Okay. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, what, one question. What, what do you uh, uh, use for doing the strain inside the microscope? Uh, this was uh, uh, AFM tip or what, what was the device? So we use a, uh, what's called a Pico indenter. It's uh, made uh -huh. by Brooker. There are other brands out there as well. Uh, it's basically an in-situ straining stage in the scanning electron microscope. So that's oh, it's in the scanning. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's kind of like what the, our colleagues do with, uh, with AFM, but mm -hmm. albeit at much higher loads. Okay. So okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's the main difference. Other questions? Okay. Let's go ahead and, and uh, move on. So what we're going to do now is we're gonna move on to this uh, accumulative roll bonded interface. So we're one where we have these in and out of plane Berger's vector misfit uh, dislocation arrays, um, and also a very high interfacial shear strength when compared to what we just saw. So if we move on, the way we make these materials is these were made uh, at Los Alamos National Lab, actually started at uh, Carnegie Mellon with uh, Tony Rollett, uh, who was also uh, did uh, a lot of his career at uh, Los Alamos National Lab before he became a professor there. Um, but the way that this is done is you take two polycrystalline sheets of material, say A and B, can be copper and niobium, also did uh, silver and copper, we do aluminum and iron, there's a whole bunch of different things. You can do. Put them together, put it, pass them through the rolling mill, they become, the stack becomes shorter, the overall sample becomes longer, you cut up that, uh, that longer piece, you stack it again, you pass it through again. By doing this over many, many rep repetitions, usually about 13 or so, uh, you can start with a material that has maybe one millimeter uh, thickness of copper, maybe about two uh, thick millimeter thickness of niobium. There's another one, uh, copper, 
is basically a clad piece of niobium. And then you start just stacking and repeating, stacking and repeating. You lower your layer thickness, but you keep your overall sample thickness the same, pretty close to the same. And as you repeat this, it gets smaller and smaller. Or the layer thickness gets smaller and smaller, and you can reduce it all the way down to sub 10, 10 nanometers. When you think about how big is an atom, right? About oh, two, two and a half uh, angstroms, so 0 0.2, 0 0.25 nanometers. We're talking about just a few atomic diameters across each one of these individual layers. And so um, it becomes a, a very, very thin uh, layered material. <coughs> and so these, uh, these layers end up having a very um, uniform kind of structure between the layers. And so this is what I've shown before with this kind of zigzag structure. About 75 or 80 percent of the, the interfaces resemble exactly what I'm showing here on the screen. And so this becomes a wonderful model system in terms of being able to say, here's, here's a, a specific interface structure and here's how it deforms. And so I won't get into the big story here about how these form. That's, there's a, a long, long story behind that. Well, they develop because they have a low energy of formation. So thermodynamically, they want to be there in the microstructure and they can deform to large strains with the crystals minimally rotating. So everything stays pretty static. So here's a little nano trivia. So if you take a US nickel, about the same thickness as our starting sheets of material, a couple millimeters. If you got an identical reduction in rolling going from two millimeters down to 15 nanometers, how long is your nickel going to be at the end of this? Wait for it. 2.2 kilometers. So 20 football fields, right? Huge amounts of strain. The number of dislocations that has to go through this are just intense. This is an extreme kind of a process. And so a lot of this processing was done by Tom Mazzolek. This was back when he was a summer uh, PhD student working with me at uh, Los Alamos. Now he's actually a staff member at Los Alamos. So it's important to know when you go do your summer internships, do a good job, you might be there for a while. It's also even more important to know that when you have somebody like Tom or somebody else good working for you, they may become your program managers later on or your boss. I've had that happen with two postdocs now. And so the moral of the story is be good to your postdocs and students. So if we deform these, uh, these materials, uh, similarly to what we did with the PBD, we take a pillar, here's our pillar, and what we're gonna do is deform it in steps and take pictures. So we deform it a little bit, we get point B, or excuse me, deform it a little bit, we get point A, which is point A on the stress strain curve here. Deform a little more, we get point B. Deform a little more, we get point C. Deform it a little bit more than that, we get point D. <clears throat> During this process, what you notice is we don't get this nice single shear band anymore like we had in the PVD case. We get what's called diffuse shear banding, where we have multiple shear bands going across the material that then eventually just lead to failure. So sure, it's a very strong material, two GPA flow stress here, but not particularly deformable. Um, and what we found was that it's very consistent with deformation. If you were just to take a pure single crystal of copper, compress it in the same crystallographic direction. So if you were to compress along the 112 direction in copper, um, very similar kind of behavior, but just at a very much enhanced stress. So all those interfaces are acting as obstacles, but they're really not uh, giving rise to new deformation mechanisms like what we saw with the PVD material. So we wanted to contrast a little bit more between these two. <clears throat> we can take a look at some molecular dynamic simulations. We can compare the interfacial shear strength of PVD material versus our ARB material. And if we go with our PVD material, so this is a map looking down onto the interface. And if you were to now shear that material in any one of these directions, what will happen is you will have an interfacial shear strength associated with shearing in that direction. And that's this blue dotted line. What you find is that in some directions, it's only a couple hundred MPa, which is very consistent with what we measured in the transmission electron microscope. So hey, you know, you got uh, modeling and experiment uh, coming together here, life is good. 
<clears throat> if you compare this with what you calculate for the uh, uh, ARB interface, you'll find that that same yield surface gives us stresses that are always in, uh, in excess of one and a half GPA. So it's much, much stronger in shear. What does that mean? It means all those sliding mechanisms that we had in the PVD interface are not available in this case. They're turned off. So you get this very different kind of behavior. So before I move into uh, the idea of the, the 3D interface, any question about these kind of bulk uh, uh, ARB interfaces and how they, they deform? Nate, I have a quick question. Sure. A question out of ignorance here. So in the ARB, your dislocations are, are so even or semi-even in, in length and depth. Why do they form that way? Ah, so that's a good question too. So <clears throat> it all depends on what the low energy state is of atomic rearrangements to be able to relieve the structural mismatch between the copper and the niobium, which is also tied to its uh, elastic modulus, right? And so you could rearrange these in you know, one of myriad ways, but when we think about the disregistry in atoms between what has to happen in copper and what has to happen in niobium, there's going to be certain configurations of those dislocations because their elastic strain fields interact with one another. And at the end of the day, you still have to relieve this certain amount of elastic stress between the copper and the niobium. So what this configuration is, is one that relieves those, that mismatch for the crystallographic orientation that we have uh, between copper and niobium in this ARB configuration. And so if you change that crystallographic orientation and you change those depths or widths of those dislocations, do you change their resistance to shear also or? Absolutely, yep. That's exactly right. And that's, that's what we're playing with actually in this next uh, 3D gradient interface. So when you, when you look at what we have here, what we have is the same orientation relationship and interface plane as what we had in the two dimensional case. But instead of having this nice flat interface here, which we can, we can see in the 2D case, now what we've done is we've jumbled it all up. And so by co-sputtering copper and niobium between the two pure phases, now we've entered a whole new world of variables in what that structure can resemble. But at the end of the day, you've still got to have the same disregistry between copper and niobium. You're still relieving the same mismatch, but now we're relieving that mismatch over a larger volume of material. So the question is, what the heck happens with these interfaces? What does that do to a, a dislocation? What does it end up wanting to do? Um, that's uh, what we get into next. So the idea of grading an interface is not new, right? This has been around for a long time. We, uh, <clears throat> you see it in, in what are known as functional graded materials. Uh, here's an example between alumina and zirconia. You can take over the span of millimeters a alumina rich material, add a little more zirconia, add a little more zirconia until it becomes zirconia rich. These types of microstructures and these kinds of uh, gains are used to uh, relieve uh, incompatibilities in either mechanical properties or, or the uh, structure in an abrupt interface. It's used in jet turbine engines where you'll have some kind of an intermetallic um, uh, substrate that makes your turbine blade and then you want to coat that with some kind of a hard heat resistant coating. Those are incompatible materials. And so these kinds of functionally graded uh, interfaces have been commonly used there. You can also play games with uh, the, just the grain size in a material. So on the inside of a material, on the interior, you could have this coarse grain structure. You can then maybe, uh, maybe you ball peen or you severely deform the surface of the material and you can refine the grain size and uh, uh, have this kind of smaller grain size in this kind of a region. And then closest to the surface of the material where you've really deformed it and refined the grains, you can get these very fine grain sizes. This has been seen in copper, it's been seen in uh, stainless steel um, and other types of materials where the goal is really, can you just increase both the strength and the plasticity of this, of this particular kind of material. So this has been done for quite some time. 
But materials can also be 3D structured at the atomic scale. So you can do things where it happens on accident. So radiation induced segregation is something. You stick a bunch of uh, 316 stainless steel into a nuclear reactor. So that's a workhorse material in a nuclear reactor. What happens to the grain boundaries? Well, you'll start to enrich nickel and you'll start to deplete chromium. And that affects both the corrosion properties and also the uh, mechanical properties of these materials. You can do this to uh, uh, ceramic intermetallic interfaces. Same kind of things happen. You get either depletion or segregation to those interfaces. The other thing you can do is you can do this stuff on purpose. So if we take our copper niobium, one of our favorite materials, and we go ahead and ion irradiate this, what you can do is start to blur these interfaces from the uh, ballistic collisions that happen between an incoming ion and your, uh, your material. What that will do is it can induce a certain amount of mixing. So at the interface, you can have a copper concentration gradient and a niobium concentration gradient that occurs over about 20 nanometers or so, depending on your irradiation conditions. What does that do to our mechanical properties? Well, if you do a similar experiment to like what we had uh, seen uh, earlier, these micropillars, and you irradiate the material at liquid nitrogen temperatures, so that means that you mix the material and then it's quenched in. It doesn't have a chance to phase separate, which is what it thermodynamically wants to do. And so you end up uh, being left with these compositional gradients. And as you notice here, it increases the shear strength of the interface by about a factor of of uh, two or so relative to um, other materials where they remain phase separated after irradiation. So what we know from the literature without doing other experiments is that when you get these 3D interfaces, the interfacial shear strength goes up. And we know that's one of the key parameters for uh, mechanical deformation. So here's what we're doing. Here's the sharp 2D interface. You've got discrete dislocations, so four of them here. Let's put them in an MD simulation. Here's their one, two, three, four dislocations, and they have stress fields associated with them, which kind of resemble these butterflies, right? And so that's a sharp interface. Those misfit dislocations relieve the, the immediate elastic strains at that interface. If we now use a chemically diffuse 3D interface, maybe it looks something like this, like a, a, some interlocking fingers or or some kind of, a, of another graded structure. Now, our structure becomes much, much more complex. And so while we still accommodate the same total mismatch between the two pure phases, we now accommodate it with a completely different structure. And what we'll see is that influences the properties. So how do we make these? <clears throat> well, we take them, we uh, grow these in a, in a in a magnetron sputtering chamber, but instead of doing a 2D interface, now what we do is we grow our pure phase, maybe it's niobium, we gradually turn on our copper source and turn off our niobium source to grade our 3D interface. There's a lot of different knobs we can turn when we do that. And then we end up with a pure copper phase above that. And then you repeat this again, you turn one target off, turn one target on. Very similar to what we did uh, with uh, uh, the 2D interface uh, copper knife. So we'll look at a case where we've got pure copper of about a 40 nanometer layer thickness and our interface width is about 10 nanometers and then you have more uh, pure niobium on the top, 10 nanometers of uh, inner 3D interface and then 40 nanometers again of a pure phase and so on. When you grow these and you stick them in the TEM, this is what they look like. You can do an EDS scan across them like this. And what you find is that you get these nice smooth um, profiles indicative of a smooth compositional gradient. When we look a little bit closer in the TEM, this is what we see. So you've got alternating layers of copper and niobium and copper and niobium, but you can make out these kind of gray blurry regions between the two. That's our 3D interface. You zoom in on those, do a little high-res TEM. They're not just an amorphous material. It's not just making glass. You're making a mix of ordered regions, which you can see here in, indicated by the uh, lattice fringes, and then also these kinds of oatmeal-y looking regions, which uh, don't have quite the same degree of ordering. You can see this also, we get a, another uh, orientation relationship called Michi on the Wasserman, which is uh, very close to, to what uh, you see in Kurdimov-Sachs. It's only about seven degrees off or so. So very, very similar. 
Now, if you stress these, <clears throat> what do they look like? So here's our 2D case from, that I showed earlier. You add 3D interfaces, the same pure layer thickness, and strength goes up by about a factor of 25% or so. You see very different kind of behavior here in, uh, in, uh, in microfilling compression. We were to section our deformed pillar. What's it look like? Well, again, you see this shear band, right? So <clears throat> you can see that in SEM here. If you put in the TEM and you follow a layer all the way across the shear band, you notice that it remains continuous, just like we had in the 2D case. But here we have a very high interfacial shear strength. We actually just measured this. These are our, our fresh results. Um, but so the mechanism that is operating behind this process has to be different. You zoom in on the region such as this. <clears throat> now what you see is you can see our, uh, our copper layer. It thins gradually as you enter into the shear band. And you can look at different regions. We've looked at the uh, region inside the shear band, outside the shear band, and so forth. And what we found is that after deformation within the shear band, as you both thin uh, and rotate, <clears throat> rotated the layers, um, but by a different process than what we've seen by PVE. Uh, 3D interface still persists after we've deformed it. So you can see your 3D interface right here. Um, and uh, copper starts to rotate right at the edge of the shear band. So here's coppers in the middle, or in the edge of the shear band. Niobium is outside. The planes of copper have started to rotate. Niobium is still pretty static. And as you move inside the shear band, both of these phases now start to co-rotate, they become coincident, and we see that the 3D interface also rotates. So we're currently working on trying to figure out how does this transition layer actually stack up with the, uh, uh, the rest of the material. This is work that's still, still in progress. Um, but what, we've, what we have are data sets of all of those high resolution TEM micrographs in these different regions. So if you do one, two, three, four, five, about 12 different uh, TEM micrographs, you can actually quantify the degree of rotation you're getting as a function of position. And so we're still working towards this. So that sort of summarizes what we've got for the, um, for the, uh, 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 the 3D interface portion here. So what we've seen overall in the copper niobium system is that the strength and the onset of shear instability are really tied to the atomic structure of the bimetal interface, right? Our mantra, it's all about the interface, still holds here. Uh, we've got ARB nanolaminates that get this nice preferred interfacial structure uh, throughout them. And we find that 3D interface materials end up enhancing the strength over 2D uh, interfaces of the same layer thickness. So you can actually enhance the properties without changing uh, the morphology or the uh, chemistry very much. And uh, you know, all of this work on deformation mechanisms, what a dislocation sees as it encounters an interface like this, this is stuff that's still under investigation. So any questions on the 3D interface portion here? I've got one small section afterwards on fracture, but I think we're just about on time. It looks like we have a question, but I think you're on mute. Sorry. Is the interface totally flat? You don't see any thickness variations? Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so the question becomes, not only is it flat, but how do you define any tortuosity, right? Okay. You, you mm -hmm. say that tortuosity is defined by having a single niobium atom within the copper lattice? Is that, is that your threshold for the tortuosity? Is it uh, taking a, an ISO concentration surface and thresholding it and saying, yep, at 10%, I'm gonna consider that pure? So that's, that's a key question here. What I've shown so far doesn't include anything like atom probe tomography, which is what you gotta do to get three-dimensional information of what the local chemistry is of this interface. So we've started doing that. That's uh, work that we're doing with Oak Ridge National Laboratory with their uh, nanoscience center and uh, John Poplowski out there. And we're trying to quantify that roughness uh, as best we can. 
And so it's a, it's a key question. Yeah. Is that, is that roughness, uh, does it change as we get the interfaces closer and closer to one another? Um, we don't know. Um, but that's something that we're trying to quantify. I've got a potentially naive question. Um, sorry, Miguel, were you, were you done? No, no, yes, I was done, yes. It's potentially naive, so forgive, forgive my ignorance. But I was just curious if um, anybody's thought about using these 3D uh, boundaries to grow 3.5 materials on silicon. Because that's one of the longstanding problems in silicon photonics. I was just curious if, if you, you could comment on that. So you do you do use you know functional grading for uh, for uh, for functional materials regularly, and it's because you don't want any misfit, misfit dislocations, right? You want to get a, as nice of a of an epitaxial growth as you possibly can. Um, I am not sure right offhand uh, which systems have been looked at, um, but I know I know that. Uh, you know, when we were thinking about this, 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 uh, this project initially, that there are implications for going into, into semiconductor materials as well. Um, the, of course, you know, the theme there is very different because yeah, you hate dislocations when it comes to epitaxial thin, thin growth, uh, film growth. In our case, we're trying to harness them. And so that's where these two things kind of start to diverge. But, uh, but yeah, certainly um, the deposition techniques and how these would re uh, react to say thermal mismatch strains all becomes, that's kind of where these, these two fields start to align. Yeah. That's a good question. Other questions? All right, I got, I got seven minutes so I can do this. <clears throat> I think I got about seven slides. So <clears throat> let's get to the breaking bad part here. So fracture across length scales, right? becomes a huge, huge issue. We're going to move away now from, from nano uh, composites. We're going to go towards generally making fracture resistant chemistries and microstructures. How to make stuff not break. A lot of stuff breaks right now. We've got job security as material scientists, no problem, right? Fracture happens all around us in bridges, automobiles, um, it can be on our table legs, you know, whatever, you name it. So the question is, can we shorten the time required to develop better material com compositions to improve fracture toughness? And the question becomes, well, what affects the combination of strength defect interactions or dislocations come up again, phase transformations come up in the vicinity of crack tips to optimize plasticity? So this right here is what's known as a compact tensile, tensile sample. What you do is you put a pre-notch in right here, you machine that in with a couple of holes, and then you have a crack that's emanating from that notch. As that crack grows in this direction, ahead of that crack tip, you'll have what's known as the plastic zone, which is this sort of magenta feature right here. It looks like a kidney or a kidney bean. <clears throat> and uh, what we're concerned with is what's happening in this plastic zone, and how does that dictate the propagation of the crack? Well, it's been known for a long time that if you take a crack in a material, so that's these planes right here, at the tip of that crack, what you'll have is this plastic zone and it changes whether or not you're on the surface of a specimen. So if you're right here on the surface, or if you start to go deep inside the specimen, you go from conditions that are known as plane stress on the surface to plane strain in the middle. That changes the size and shape of this plastic zone. So you have an intrinsic size effect. Even when you're doing large scale mechanical testing, you think about these types of things. <clears throat> Moreover, you have other multivariate dependencies. You gotta worry about things like temperature. Example would be things like a brittle deductile transition. And so this is a, a plot of impact energy. And so this is the energy required to break a material if you hit it with a, basically a big hammer um, versus temperature. And what you notice is that at low temperatures, this is for steels, <clears throat> and so we'll take a, a fairly low carbon steel, 0 0.01 or 0.11% carbon. As you go from, say, negative uh, 100 C, and you heat this material, all of a sudden the material increases its toughness or its tendency to be ductile um, exponentially. And what this arises from are changes in mechanisms 
of what's happening ahead of this crack tip. So you have a profound influence of temperature on certain classes of materials. Steels are one of them, uh, BCC metals. Um, so steels would be in that category. Um, you can have it in silicon. You can have it in all kinds of different sorts of materials. So you've got these temperature dependencies. You've got a specimen size dependency. You've got strain rate dependencies. You've got crystal system orientation dependencies, all kinds of things. So the question becomes, these standardized samples they, they require dimensions that aren't always representative of small scale behavior. What if you're worried about a, an interconnect in an IC circuit, for instance? These types of tests don't do you a whole lot of, of good. <clears throat> so what we want to be able to do is really be able to understand these size effects at those small length scales. <clears throat> so we can look at silicon. That's a great one to look at. We can look at stainless steel. Even. Let's look at silicon first. You can make these in different forms. You can make silicon nanopillars. You can make silicon nanospheres. You can make silicon beams. And you can change their sizes, no problem. And what we find is that there's a profound influence on the fracture toughness. That's what this K1C um, value is. Things get bigger. Um, the fracture, uh, fracture toughness tends to go down. As they go up, the fracture toughness tends to go up. And granted, there's a couple of data sets here that only have two data points. You can draw a trend line. Usually the way you do that is you test two, uh, two samples, then you head over to the pub, and then you draw your trend line. Um, what we're doing here is just making a rough correlation to say that just the shape of these things for a similar size makes a whole lot of difference. And you can see this, um, these effects, when you look at a, a sample of, um, of uh, stainless steel in the transmission electron microscope. So this is a bend beam. We got a little crack right here. And then we have a probe that we're gonna push in this direction. As we do this, actually I've got some issues of encoding, but we'll stop right here. So now we've opened this crack. And what you'll start to see is we'll emit dislocations from the tip of this crack. And you'll see them right there. That's these kind of dark features that are right here. And as you push farther and farther, they build up and they emit a back stress on this crack, which effectively toughens it. It reduces the stress intensity. And so it reduces the ability of that crack to propagate. And as we pull this probe back, you find that these dislocations disappear back into the crack itself. So all of these processes, when we're talking about dislocations and their motion ahead of crack tips, this is exactly what we're talking about. So if you can control those dislocations ahead of a crack, you control its fracture, fracture behavior. So there's a model. This is a model that Professor Gerberich has been working on for about oh, eight years or so. It's an analytical model that is very simple, but manages to capture a few key parameters. Things like the effective stress, which we can get out of the applied stress on the material. Things like the activation volume, which is tied to the volume that's swept by a dislocation as it overcomes an obstacle. Both of these parameters are easily measurable by things like tensile testing, micropillar testing, nano indentation, and so forth. You've got some, you've got a, a exponential term here, and you've got, you know, an activation energy. You've got a couple of, uh, of parameters um, uh, here, a couple of constants that are typically close to one, so they're not even really fitting parameters. And then, of course, KT as usual. And so what this predicts is the energy release rate, which is tied uh, intimately to fracture toughness. So the question is, is can you tie how a dislocation gets over an activation energy barrier, it can be thermally activated and also mechanically activated, how can you tie this kind of behavior to an expression like this? Because what that does is it allows you to take these different mechanisms and the materials that you have characteristic values for these key parameters, which are then in turn responsible for what happens ahead of your crack tip. So what we're doing is uh, taking nano indentation and micropillar compression. We're doing a slew of different tests at different uh, temperatures and strain rates. We jump um, strain rates. We uh, test at different temperatures and so forth. And you're able to get this tau star V star that allows us to use our expression. We then use that to predict fracture at these small length scales, and we can compare it to three-point bending. <clears throat> and so this is what happens with silicon. 
we found that it holds pretty well for silicon single crystals. So if you look at temperature here, and you look at um, results that are taken from small scale fracture toughness testing. So here's a, a set of data where we're using LEFM, so linear elastic fracture mechanics. So this is kind of the conventional way of looking at fracture. Then by looking at TEM afterwards, we can take into account the shielding effects, so those dislocations ahead of a crack tip. Now, if we take a separate set of data and predict what the fracture toughness should be, we get this solid line here, or these open points. And what you find is it follows the, the trend pretty darn well for silicon. You can also do this for tungsten. And so tungsten is even more complicated because it goes through a ductile to brittle transition that's even more abrupt than silicon. And um, we can measure our tau star, V star as a function of, te of temperature. And what you find is that if you compare data from uh, uh, tungsten polycrystals that have a little bit of rhenium, you compare that to undeformed tungsten single crystals, which are these open, uh, open symbols here, and then you compare that to what we theoretically predicted, you capture this increase in toughness with increasing temperature actually quite well. What's missing from this? What we need to do is figure out what the effects of sample size are on these model predictions. It works in bulk pretty darn well for relatively simple systems. But what happens when you start going to small length scales or chemistries that we care about in, in industrially relevant alloys? <clears throat> and so with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up. We've talked about our mantra. Uh, it's all about the interface. We've talked about uh, our, our nanolaminates. We've talked a little bit about fracture here today. Also the importance of three dimension, um, dimensional features in, uh, in interfaces. So I hope that you take some of these things by, uh, uh, you know, to heart and that you share the mantra that we have where it's all about the interface. So to finish this all up, here's our team, the M cube team, not to be confused with 3M, which is just down the road from us and very good collaborators, we're M cubed, even better. That's the Mara multi-scale mechanics team. And so we're seeking motivated PhD students. We're looking for postdocs. We're hiring right now. Um, and this is, this is our, our growing team. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up. Awesome. Thank you, Nate. That was fantastic, as always. Um, you know, we're part of, we're uh, jointly sponsoring this, the Center for Materials Interfaces in Research and Applications. That's us. So we, ju we uh, absolutely agree. It's all about the interfaces. Materials enthusiasts and interface enthusiasts. Absolutely. Do we have some other questions? Um, I'll ask one while we're sort of, people are kind of gearing up again. So you've talked about how the interfaces affect slip and strain between two materials, but how do the interfaces affect other types of functionality? I'm thinking back to one of the examples you showed for like a nuclear plant. And I kind of remember there's like bubbles of hydrogen or some odd gas that get produced in those materials. So what kind of interface do you want there? Do you want a gradient? Do you want those step interfaces you sort of saw in the ARB? What's the best? Yeah, so um, what's been shown to date um, is that ideally what you have would be these, this matrix or this array of misfit dislocations. And some will be in plane in one direction. Some will be in the same plane and might have burgers vectors in a different direction. Where those, um, those misfit arrays intersect are highly disordered regions. And so they have a lot of elastic strain energy at those points. If you have something like you're trying to capture helium, so the, the irradiation example, trying to capture helium, helium loves to, uh, it's, it's, uh, it loves to go to, to regions where it's energetically favorable to do so. And so those intersections are really kind of, uh, kind of key, then it becomes a question of, well, if you take a 3D interface, what do those intersections look like? Have you, have you completely made a continuum of that disk registry? Or have you made now new sites that are even better for absorbing helium? Are you making spots where you might have some kind of tortuous path for the helium to make it out of the material? Um, these are, are, are all open questions. So it really comes down to what is that interfacial structure 
And once you start understanding that and knowing how to characterize it, then you can start looking at all these other different functionalities. So there's a lot of potential there. Awesome. How about some other questions? I know we've asked a lot throughout. Well, I, I want to thank you uh, for this magnificent talk. I, it just shows also to our students that metals are still a hot material. I mean, those material science doesn't mean exotic new materials, but it's a lot to learn in metals. Yeah? So it's, I, I would like to ask you something. Have you, uh, or could you consider the, uh, when you do the deposition, the, the metal deposition of two interfaces, uh, can you rotate the interface like, uh, you know, remember the very old experiment of Balufi uh, in the 70s. So he took two crystals and rotated two. Can you do something like that to look for a uh, uh, coincidence boundary or something like that? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So um, to some degree we can, it's difficult to, to do it in a controlled fashion. So one of the ways you can do that is, uh, and I kind of alluded to it, is you've got these um, uh, kurjimov sachs boundaries, and then you have Nishiyama-Wasserman boundaries. And mm -hmm. the difference between those two is actually largely rotational. And it's about 70, or excuse me, seven degrees within that plane. Okay. It's not as, it's not as neat of a problem as, as like what Belufia has done. Um, but those microstructures exist in these materials. And so you can, uh, within a given, say, TEM specimen, find regions that have these different sorts of rotational disregistries and um, do a certain amount of investigation there. But yeah, it's, it's tough to, to really keep all your variables straight and, and to just be able to do a one-to-one -one correlation between, a one-to-one -one study between them. Yeah, it'd be fantastic if you could do that, though. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Oh, and just to, 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 to finish up here with this, this concept with, yeah, there's lots, lots to do in metals. I mean, the way that I like to think about it is that it's, uh, it's the Goldilocks of materials. The polymers are too soft, ceramics are too hard, <laughs> metals are just right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Only half of my group agrees. <laughs> <laughs> to, be, to be honest, I'm, I'm a materials agnostic. I, I've been working now more in, in polymers than I ever thought I would. Um, they're all so interesting. Um, so I, I work on, on all of them. Um, but uh, metals are, are my, my first, I guess, my first love in, in material science. And now I'm branching out into others. Fantastic. Any other questions? How about we thank our speaker one more time? Fantastic, Nate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Really, really thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah, we can't really take you out to the pub after this, you know. And, uh, yeah. well, we have a Flagstaff's finest brew pubs, but. Um, yeah. I'll. Uh, I'll have a, a Wisconsin beer here for you. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I live in Wisconsin, but I, you know, I, I, I work in, in, uh, in Minnesota, so we have beer from both places. Don't tell anybody, but it, it tastes remarkably similar. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not too surprised. Uh, I, I, I just want to make a uh, last comment. I'm glad that you mentioned the TMS. It's a great society, and you know, now the influence of the MRS is so strong that people are 